Hello and welcome to Explore Discipline Agile in three webinars. I'm Fabio Rigamonti and I will be your host for tonight. This is the second webinar, Discipline Agile from the Field. And I'm talking about a series of webinars because last week we had the first installment, Discipline Agile in a nutshell. This week we will have Discipline Agile from the Field with Jean-Yves Klein, um, Discipline Agile Chapter Champion for the PMI France Chapter, and Andy Burns, also Discipline Agile Chapter Champion for PMI Southwest Ohio Chapter. And the third installment of this series will be next week when we will have Scott Hambler, Chief Scientist of Discipline Agile at PMI, answering your questions. So some technical information about some questions we, we received last week. PDU, if you enter your PDU, sorry, if you enter your PMI membership ID while registering for this webinar, then PDUs will be automatically reported in approximately in two weeks time. If you didn't, enter your PDU while registering for this webinar, it will be in your charge to report the webinar, the, the PDUs for this webinar. About the webinar format, all the three webinars are pre-recorded. Therefore, live interaction during live is limited. You might ask questions maybe about uh, some technical information, we will try to reply, but these questions will not be answered by the speakers during the event. All the recordings and slides will be made available after the conclusion of the series. And finally, if you have questions, curiosities, doubts, ideas, basically, Everything you always wanted to know about Discipline Agile, but were afraid to ask, this is your chance. Send all the questions you have to the email address you see here, the ACC, Discipline Agile Chapter Champion, at pmi-nic.org before the 20th of June, and Scott Ambler will answer to the questions before uh, during the third webinar so i will pass the mic to geneva klein so he can share his uh, slide deck and we are ready to go thank you geneva hello this is johnny klein i will speak about discipline agile from this field First of all, I will just show you what tool do, you, do we use. We use to know many, many, many tools. If you are a good agilist, you may use a lot of tools. Knowing some tools, knowing many tools will help you in your, in your works. In this, in this slide, you can see a lot of tools that people, good agilists, could use or know. I will use and present some of them. This is one kind of tool that I used to settle in agile teams. We used to build scrum roles with different projects, and you can see we put the ID photo of people who are working on different subjects. With making such a tools, we are working for people and easily they can see where are problems. You can see those five projects and by the way, you can find which project is on problem. You will see this project, we have a some trouble because they cannot start easily. There are too many things we are waiting. By, 
by using those kind of tools, you will help people and the team to be easily in their work. I also work on mechanics project. Here is the Volvo context before starting. As you can see, they are, they are a big, big company with global distribution and sometimes with outsourcing, outsourcing for their project. If we speak about compliance, we are between process and financial and technical. It's a very, very multi-platform legacy for their business in their domain. It's only a complex project, but for their new project, for their future project, as you can see, there is many things that change. Now they are working on life critical project because they are building autonomous trucks. The team size keep bigger, and they are trying to simplify their project by working on the same time zone. And the organizational is still the same, but the complexity they are trying to simplify also the complexity to manage their project. By the way, by seeing their project became more complex. So their future con context is much complex and much hard to settle. This is why they are trying their best to simplify many things to help their project and their teams to win all the goals that they have to achieve. So this is why they keep using PI planning on their project and also they're trying hard their best. If we are looking on people on another project, which are I am helping them on IoT project, there are some, here is the actual context with the small teams in the same time zone in the simple company, in the single company, their compliance is only process and they are only working on new integrated solution for their technical complexity. In their domain complexity, they are straightforward. But their future context, now also with the COVID problems, their future project are same, their compliance, they keep on working in process, but the company is growing up rapidly. They, are, they will merge with a bigger company than themselves, so their project will be really different to manage. So they will keep working on the same time zone, and now they will have to work with contractors. The complexity domain is still straightforward, and now they are working more value, more to legacy solution. So as you can see, they will have to change their culture. They will have to change many things to keep on working on agile project. It will be a really complex problem for them to, um, to work with those all of those new colleagues that they will uh, get next week so as you can see we have to change the culture of the people it's not easily to, to settle it's not easily to do the best way that we find to do this it's using serious game i often use serious game because it's really better than showing something, we took the people and we, we explained something and then they have to understand it by doing. And using their hand, 
they will understand many things that they already seen but they didn't understand. Using serious game, it's for me um, the best way to teach people new things because they will have to use new concepts, they will have to use new things and they will and they all easily can take that, that all that they learn in their new context and in their new jobs and in their, their new project. As you can see, we have many, many uh, types of uh, Lego serious game. We used to have Lego for DevOps. We have used to have Lego for security. We, all, we also have Lego for Scrum and so on. Actually, for me, it's, it's the best way to take people to new domains and new demands. This is also why we used to play serious game during trainings. And our new trainings are without slide and only with serious games. The only thing, the last thing that I want to show you is speak about value. Mr. Eli Goldratt, sorry, there is just a small mistakes because sometimes somebody sometimes it's Eli Goldratt and sometimes it's Eliyahu Goldratt tell that tell me how you do you measure me and I'll tell you how I behave. It's very important to choose how you will measure your teams, how you will measure your project. If you measure your teams with wrong KPI it won't be good. Don't your project won't be good and your people won't be satisfied to working on project with one KPI. When I start working, my first boss uh, showed me the company and uh, as I sh I she showed me a desk with an older uh, colleague, she told, "Oh, this this guy is very good. His work later." If he's often working late. Oh, so I understood that in this company, to be a good guy, you have to finish late. It doesn't matter if you make good, good stuff. It's the only point that your boss is, work, is looking for is only if you are finishing late. So I became a good guy. I finished late. So really be careful to how do you measure your project how do you measure your teams how do you measure the agility that you're working on what is the best way what do you want to check what do you want to to solve it's if it's if you are only working on time if you are only working on money it's 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 not the same kind of project that you will have to settle. It won't be the same kind of KPI that you will have to look on. And I also just want to speak about agile bullshit. So many times, agile teams are making bullshit because if, the, if teams the more important for me is does the team can change their process? Can they do they change their process based on what they learn? This is the first principle for me of discipline agile. If the team cannot change their process, they will keep on working on something who might not be so good. So try to make the best for the for your team. Let them give them the power to change their process based on what they learn. It's very important. This is why I choose discipline agile. Before agility, 
we use to work like in um, waterfall and so on. And now, if you are looking on big teams using SAFE, for many agilists, this is what they think. They think that SAFE is not agile because team cannot change their way of working. For many managers, this is what they think. SAFE is like, is like the army. Everybody must do what they are told to do. It is not, it's not still agile. For every epic owner, SAFE is a really complex thing that is not working. This is why we have to explain and teach epic owner how do they have to work with any agile teams. If we do not do this job, it won't work. You can work with a bad agile team. You can work with a bad Scrum Master. You cannot reach anything with a bad product owner or, the, or a bad epic owner. You must focus on them because there is no way to swim on the, to have a, a boat. Uh, you, can, you, cannot, you, can, you cannot go to the right cap if you, if you, not, if you do not have a right epic owner or a right product owner. This is why many teams members think that SAFE is not, it's only a huge thing that didn't give them something good for their life. Don't forget that if they are working on this project, it's also to give them something good. If you are only working on SAFE on, or huge project for the company, don't forget that they also need something good for people who are working for them. And this is what I think. You can make something huge with, with safe or so on, but so many times there is only chicken who are running without, without their head because we used to, they used to apply something which is not good for people who are working on. This is also why I chose this, to working on Discipline Agile, because we used to understand what is the company, to understand what are they working on, and then we will choose one of the six um, way of working. One, one of the six um, Agile cycle. Thanks you for watching my slide. You can find me on Lyon in France. Here is my email address. Thank you very much, uh, Geneva, for for sharing your uh, your experience and to give us the the chance to learn from you. Now I uh, will move the presentation to uh, Andy Burns. Yeah. I think it's working. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce you, Andy Burns. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to start by thanking everybody who has invested in PMI because you have helped my life so much with this wonderful toolkit for Agile. You've helped me to learn, and I'd like to share some of that today. I greatly, greatly appreciate every member who has really helped to bring this product to us. So today I would share two instances of continuous guided improvement. My context is 1,200 software engineers building a engineering platform called Team Center for Siemens. And these two anti-patterns came up on top of the SAFE model. So let me jump into the first anti-pattern that I faced. And I call this the Andy anti-pattern. And what happened 
was when we launched, when we started, I had 130 teams, 130 teams, 1,200 software engineers, and they had to start, and we wanted them to start. And so we told them all, go and do Scrum. And this was all right, except for six of the teams, where it was absolutely the wrong thing to tell them to do. Those six teams had no use for Scrum. It was not the right solution for what they were doing. And they were very upset by this. And after a few program increments, they decided they wanted to meet to discuss this. So I had to prepare to a meeting or I had to prepare for a meeting where I had made a mistake and that mistake was going to be extremely visible. How uncomfortable. Disciplined Agile provides a toolkit that I can use to understand ways to go forward in tricky situations. And so one thing that you do is look at these process goals and say, okay, I have some teams that are upset. Now in a typical project, you're always doing some inception type goals. You're always forming up new teams, looking at funding, developing vision. And I have some ideas when I look at these that, well, probably I want to evolve the way of working and do something different with these teams that are so upset. But the thing that Disciplined Agile teaches me is it's not important what Andy thinks. What's important is what the team thinks. And so what I do is get together with the 70 people that are so upset and say, let's talk about what we can do. Here are some of the process goals. These are some of the things that are really, really important. And I'd like to take a vote here. So I'm just going to use this software on the screen now and say, I'm, I'm going to just set up a vote and I'd like to hear your opinion about which ones of these process goals we should focus on. Where can we get better? Let's do a retrospective on this and let's think of several areas that we could improve. So I'll go ahead and start this voting. And while I'm starting the voting, I'll just look at these and say, you know, here's Evolve way of working. What is Evolving way of working about? Um, it's about how you organize your teams, how you communicate as teams, what process, practices and processes will you follow? Hmm, that seems very interesting. What life cycle will we follow? Hmm, they hate Scrum. So as we go through and vote, I will talk to the teams and say, here's these different process goals. Which one of these is resonant? Which one of these will help us to fix the problem that we face today? You can see there are 21 process goals that Disciplined Agile gives us at the team level. And I'm just going to go through and vote. And as I go in and um, do my voting, it will show us that we have got an issue that we can solve. So I just need to go back for one moment because I made a tiny mistake in the voting. But what happened here is I got an opportunity to show these process goals to people and say, which ones get you energized? And as you can see, I've got a few different votes on things like growing the team and evolving the, uh, evolving the way of working. And so maybe what's really interesting to people here is evolving the way of working. And so I'm going to go and take a look at this evolving way of working goal. Now you can see I have all of the decision points for all of the different phases on this board. But in particular, I'm going to dive down now into evolve way of working and just take a quick look at that. So I'll say, yeah, I think we've picked this one. And now I'm going to go and look at evolve way of working. And now here I am. Here's Evolve way of working. That's the process goal. Here's some decision points about evolving way of working. And once again, I will set up a vote and I will say to the team, okay, I'd like everybody to um, come forward and vote on these ideas, these different decisions, and let's see which decision we should revisit. So I'll set up a vote here and say, okay, we're going to vote on these decision points. And I'm, I'm happy with those. So we're going to look at those and I'm going to start the voting. And when we're looking at these decisions, I'd like you to just consider where is our problem? 
Well, is it with the physical environment? Um, what, what would that mean? Well, uh, do we not have rooms where people can work? Are we not set up for Agile? Do we not have an Agile planning room? What is, what's going on with how we are set up? Um, how about select life cycle? Um, well, look here. The number one life cycle that Disciplined Agile recommends is continuous delivery Kanban. The number 10, or one of the lowest choices, is the Scrum life cycle. Above these are Agile and Lean. So Disciplined Agile and Disciplined Agile Lean are better life cycles. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that it's okay as a matter of retrospection to say we don't want to do Scrum anymore. We want to switch to another life cycle. And what do these life cycles mean? Well, you'll have to go into the Disciplined Agile Way of Working book to understand this better. But there are certainly options here that I hadn't considered when I started with 130 teams. I just told everybody, go do Scrum. I didn't give them the choices that were available. And these teams that were so upset with me, it turns out that they would have been happier with starting with Lean or Kanban. And Disciplined Agile informs us that this is actually a good place to start. So if I had looked at the Disciplined Agile book, I would have seen that the suggestions here were Disciplined Agile, Lean, or Disciplined Agile's version of Scrum. I didn't take either of those. In fact, I took one of the least desirable recommendations, still a good recommendation. And if you go into the Way of Working book, there's descriptions of these and why they're good and bad and why you might want to do one or the other and my, why you might want to switch. And so as you've just seen, I've gone through one of these, but I can go through several and say, well, maybe it's identifying potential improvements. What sort of decisions can we make there? Um, we can map our value streams. We can measure what's going on. Is the velocity on this team good? Um, we can do some modeling. Maybe we can try some ad hoc improvements. This is a possibility. Um, what else can we do? Tailor the initial process, perhaps? Uh, maybe we need to go in and do a process tailoring workshop and change the Scrum. Uh, maybe we can adopt some DA suggestions. Maybe we can look at how we're recognizing the Agile, Lean Agile mindset. So I will go ahead and do some voting here. And you would spend some time. You would not rush this process. You would talk to the, the teams about what all these things mean and what their choices are and say, yes, we're going to evolve our way of working. Um, we've had some problems. Now, I will probably cast all of my votes here for select life cycle because these folks probably should not have been doing Scrum to begin with. And I will just say that I am done. Now, I've asked some of the other uh, people that are helping to put together this webinar to cast a few votes. So we'll give them a moment um, to cast a vote if they'd like to. But what you can see here is it's not important what tool I'm using to vote. It's not important that, you know, I, how I'm presenting this or what order. What's important is that the teams are voting and that the teams are making a decision on how to change things and that it's not the Andy anti-pattern. I'm not coming through and telling all these people how to do things. I'm giving them some choices and I'm guiding them through the process. And if they want to change from Scrum to Kanban, that's absolutely fine. And oh, by the way, Disciplined Agile, if I look at life cycle, also says traditional waterfall may not be the bad, worst solution. So you can see here clearly the feedback from everybody together is that we should be looking at selecting the life cycle and considering that change. The WOW workbook, the, the PMBOK for Agile that PMI now curates, will tell us the pluses and minuses, the good, the bad, the ugly of each life cycle. And so now we have a way to break the anti-pattern. Anti and it could be anybody's anti-pattern where you decide that you're just going to tell everybody how to do Agile. But if you take a moment and you slow down, you can let them be Agile. 
you can let them make some decisions about how to proceed. And when it is their decision and it's their plan, they will make sure that the recipe is cooked perfectly. So this is one lesson that I learned, which is just, I wanted very much to get everybody started on an agile transformation. And I wanted them all to know how to do agile. And so I rushed very quickly and said, go out and do scrum. And this was exactly the wrong thing to do. I should have taken the time to let them choose their way of working. And this is one of the fundamental lessons of disciplined agile. And to be honest, this is not something that is well known in the world of agile. Everybody tells you exactly how to do agile. I can quote the Scrum Guide. If you're not doing Scrum exactly as is stated in this guide, you are not doing Scrum. Scrum is immutable. Disciplined Agile is 100% different. It says everything should be tailored. And for those of you who have a PMI ACP, there is a process tailoring tool. This is really the strength of Disciplined Agile. It tells us how to tailor the process. And not only does it tell us how to tailor it initially, but it tells us what the final result might be. Continuous delivery lean is probably the best target to shoot for in agility. And that's a bold statement. And it's also saying that it's okay to start with Scrum and aim for continuous delivery lean. What a key concept. So I have a second anti-pattern I would like to talk about. And anti-pattern number two happens to deal with product ownership. And in this case, I will paint the picture and say, we had a retrospective. Everybody got together and everybody was very, very mad at the product owners. And it turned into gathering a list of 50 or more things that the product owners were doing wrong. In fact, in this session, it seemed like the product owners could not do anything right. Everybody was mad at the product owners. And Mary Pipendeck, about 10 years ago, started to say that actually the role of the product owner should be done away with. And this is really interesting because we love to have somebody who can tell us what the requirements are but nobody loves to have one person who's in charge and is the total dictator. And so product owners have a very, very hard job. And we went and went into this retrospective and we got a huge, huge list. And boy, I was in trouble. If you look at all these yellow stickies on the right-hand side of the screen, this is all the complaints that people had about our product owners. The list is really, really extensive. And so what do you do when you have so many product owner problems? Well, you tackle them one at a time. And so I went in and looked at this list and I said, okay, I'm going to have a very, very difficult conversation. Um, my product owners are going to be um, very, very unpopular. And so I need to prepare this conversation and say, how will I deal with these? And which decision points make the most sense? What will Disciplined Agile show me that can help me to deal with all of the problems that have come up? So let's look at the product owner problems. One thing I did was I put them into categories. I said, some of these have to do with customers. Some of them have to do with the product owner not being focused. So I gathered up all of the complaints and I put them into different buckets. And of course, now I'm going to vote with people. I'm going to get the people who gave me all the complaints and say, well, I've categorized these. And now I'd like to work on some of these. And I have some ideas. Uh, that come from our Agile book of knowledge, and we can all work together on these ideas. So let's start with these that, these that look like they're customer focused. And there were several problems that people brought up about product owners being out of focus. So let's talk about this, and let's go ahead and do some voting on that. 
So I'm going to invite my webinar helpers to come and vote as well. But you can see here that we've got considering the demo feedback as a defect. So we have a, de a demo. The product owner gives us some feedback and we immediately say it is a defect. You've built it wrong. That's not the purpose of a demo. The purpose of a demo is to get feedback and maybe change things or maybe create a new story. Um, blocking development team. So you won't let the development team talk to the stakeholders. Well, that's no good. Um, that could be a problem. Maybe I'll cast a vote for that. Now, what's going on is I'm asking the people that gave all of these problems to me to start to think about them and to say, what is my most important problem? And all of the people in the room will come together and they'll start voting. They'll say, well, they're not asking questions of the customer. They're not validating the customer's ideas uh, before we implement them. Um, and it's not a defect if the customer wants a change in the demo, that's not fair. So you can see that I've cast several votes here and I'm trying to prioritize these and say, okay, one of these is going to work. So I would invite the uh, people that are helping me with this demo to go ahead and do some voting too, just to make the results interesting. But you can see that I could do this with a very large group of people. And what I've done is I've kind of broken the problem down. I've said some of these are related to the customer. Here's the small slice that's related to the customer. And now I'm going to say, let's prioritize them. And now this priority is not my priority. This is the priority of the team. And the team is so important. They're the only ones that count. They're going to tell us which one of these is most important to get working on right away. And you can see here, they said number one, considering the demo feedback as a defect. And they don't like that, that it's not a defect, it's feedback in a demo. This is why we're doing demos. So I have prepared for this session and I've gone and looked at my decision points in the Agile Book of Knowledge, the WOW book. And it looks like the WOW book makes some ideas for changing stakeholder needs. It's okay if the stakeholder changes their ideas. Um, we, we have ways to work with that. So I've identified a sticky here that, well, I might want to work with that one. Uh, the next one was two, development, that blocking the development team and the stakeholder interaction. So this is um, when we're producing a consumable solution, let's explore the stakeholder needs. So I have identified several different ideas here that people can look at and say, oh, okay, well, you know, let's go look at these in the um, book of knowledge or let's go look at these in the wow book and let's see if we can find a better way to answer some of these problems. So the book of knowledge is, is really good at this. And the first thing I would say is, you know, I'll go ahead and just um, go back into my navigation panel here on the left and I'll just say, okay, um, addressing changing stakeholder needs. Um, I will um, go down and I'll look for that and say, where am I going to find addressing changing stakeholder needs? Um, it is definitely going to be something in Explore Scope. And I will take the team in and say, what can we do here um, to address their changing needs? Um, can we do persona documents? Can we do UML documents? Can we um, do user stories? And so we can continue this process of voting and looking for different ways to answer their problems. Um, developing a common vision uh, is also another potential way to do this, to look at communicating that vision, to develop, develop, look at the strategy. And you can see the numbering on these slides is very intentional. Um, it's chapter 13 in the WOW book, and it's page 208. And so what you're seeing here in this very, very quick demonstration is going through the entire 400-page book of knowledge and using it to guide continuous improvement, using it to understand the problems, but most importantly, to get the team to think about what is the number one thing they want to solve and getting them some advice on what's the best way to approach it. So I would leave you with this notion. 
in the wild book, in the agile book of knowledge, um, we have process goals. And we've talked a lot about those in the past 20 minutes. We have process goal diagrams, which tell us here are some decision points and here are some options you can take. In the wild book or the agile book of knowledge, there are also option tables. So if we make a decision to do a persona diagram, the option tables will tell us what is good and what is bad about doing a persona diagram. The good thing about a persona diagram for understanding changing stakeholder needs is it gives you a way to visualize the customer or the stakeholder in your head. The bad thing about a persona diagram is it might depersonalize your customer and you might be less inclined to actually talk to them. So these are all things that the team will think about as they look at all the options. There are 800 options in the goal diagrams and people can go through all of these options to try to find answers to their anti-patterns. So I would like to just close and say thank you for giving me this toolkit by supporting PMI and by being good members. Um, this has been a very intense and quick walkthrough of this toolkit, but it's worth a bit of study. Go in and look at these process goals, look at these goal diagrams, look at these option tables, and start to think about ways that you could apply this to your own anti-patterns or to your own problems. And remember the number one thing, don't make decisions for teams. Give them the options, tell them what's good and bad about each, each option, and let them make decisions. They must have their own plan. Choice is good. And with that, I would say thank you, and I've concluded. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andy, for this very interesting and interactive presentation. I have a couple of questions. Do you usually use this tool, this mural, within your team, or to facilitate all these decision-making process as described by uh, Choose Your Wow, or it was just for the this presentation? Um, I actually am a, a certified Discipline Agile instructor, so I use this for my classroom work, but I also use this professionally at Siemens, and PMI has a much better uh, DA browser that is coming out, which serves the same function. So uh, Miro is a great tool, Trello is a great tool, Jira is a great tool. They're all wonderful tools. Um, in the new normal with the pandemic, it's uh, very important that we all get very good at these tools. And I've just invested some time in this particular one. But I would encourage everybody, you know, look at the one on the PMI website. It's actually quite, quite much better. And I have also another very quick question. Uh, you mentioned several times anti-pattern. Can you briefly explain me a little bit more uh, what you mean with anti-pattern? Sure. Um, one anti-pattern, and we can go back and pick on my product owners again, um, and we'll just say um, my product owner um, only flies by my product only owner product owner only visits for half an hour a week this is an anti-pattern it's not a good thing it's not a bad thing it is just what it is but it's not helping us to be agile we want our product owner to be more available and so this is an anti-pattern so the two anti-patterns i just described were number one i told the teams they must do scrum mm -hmm. and they must follow the scrum pattern that is an anti-pattern because that's my plan, it's not their plan. And for them to be agile, it must be their plan. Yeah. They, they can do agile, but that's an anti-pattern. And so mm -hmm. an anti-pattern is just something you want to get, you want to change and be better at. Perfect. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much. Yeah. Uh, for, for, for dedicating uh, you and Janiv your time. I will just would like to conclude by sharing my presentation once again, um, this one, uh, because once again, I want to invite everyone from the audience, 
the one who attended the, the previous session or the one who only attended this session to send all the questions, the doubts, the idea that you have and that we will ask to Scott Embler in one week time. So thank you very much for joining this session and see you on the 2nd of July at the same time. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.